And um, so that's it for housekeeping. Um, but just before I pass it off to Joanne, I do just want to extend my thanks uh, to the Vancouver Island Master Gardeners Association um, for being a partner with us on this program um, and for being willing to kind of pivot with us into this new virtual realm um, during these unexpected circumstances. Um, so that's been really great. Uh, and a huge thanks uh, to Joanne Canning in particular for um, taking on the role of kind of coordinating this and being willing to be the first person to jump in and do one of these virtual programs. So I really appreciate that. Um, so just to introduce Joanne a little bit for those of you who don't know her, um, she volunteers, teaches and speaks on sustainable gardening. Her practical approach is based on 20, uh, 20 plus years of gardening on Vancouver Island, uh, Nova Scotia, the American Southwest and the UK. Um, she's taught at clubs, horticulture, Horticultural Societies, VIU, and Van Dusen Botanical Garden. Her articles and photographs uh, have appeared in Canadian and USA magazines and on the MGABC website. Um, so without further ado, I know we can't really do the applause thing, but uh, welcome, Joanne. <laughs> Yay! Hello, everyone. Um, this seminar is called Sprouts and Microgreens. And we'll get the uh, slide started here. So we're going to learn today how to grow our own fast food. And uh, again, before we uh, get in, get right into it, um, we have a, a wee bit of uh, housekeeping and stuff as well. Um, this is me, Joanne Canning. I'm a certified master gardener. Uh, I have been doing this now for 25 years and I'm a member of the Vancouver Island Master Gardeners Association and we are one of the affiliated chapters with the Association of BC. Uh, the master gardeners are actually international and we are represented in every province in Canada, every state in the United States and every uh, region, county, if you will, in the UK. And there are also master gardeners um, uh, in some countries in Europe. So we're presenting this as April said in partnership with the Vancouver Island Regional Library and Nanaimo Harbourfront branch. And uh, what have we got? See, there's us and there's the library. Now, the important thing here is um, that this is actually intellectual property. So I'm just gonna read this to you so everyone knows. This is copyrighted by us and the library. It's the property of uh, the library and the master gardeners and is intended for educational purposes only. Uh, commercial use of all or part of the seminar or its contents is prohibited without express written consent from uh, both parties. Now the information in this seminar is science-based as all master gardener information is. Uh, we actually, as master gardeners, have to go to school um, every year to keep our knowledge current. Um, this knowledge is accurate to the best of our knowledge and the use of this information is at the sole discretion, responsibility and liability of the user. Um, the last note on uh, images, because they are um, intellectual property, is that um, I have downloaded some of the in images from internet sources. Although they are in the public domain, uh, we have labeled these images and we thank the following for their use. Uh, also, if you, uh, Google some of these um, images or some of these uh, sites, you can get some very interesting information. So green garden products, of, uh, we use the image of the Jiffy Grow Light and Stand, uh, VPK brands in uh, Orem, Utah for their Sprouter, the Victorio, uh, A. Vogel, Canada for their Biosnacky Sprout Trays, Lee Valley Tools, Canada for the Bean Screens, Mark Broston, 
um, an image from his book, The Microgreen Garden, Indoor Grower's Guide to Gourmet Greens, a lovely book. Uh, and we used one of the microgreens images from it. iGrowNews.com, there's some interesting microgrow images and an interesting site. PlantHardware.com for grow mats and spent uh, microgreen image, also another good source. Uh, and these are all, I think, on your handouts. Uh, lastly, Chris Bennett and the Farmer's Almanac, uh, Almanac for the image of the broccoli microgreen. There, job done. Um, and on to, why do we want to grow microgreens? I'm going to close this. There we go. First of all, in terms of cost and sustainability, they really are a practical and economical way of putting fresh food on the table. And some of you who were in early probably heard me chatting with one of the attendees that I actually have kept track of costs and it really is um, cost effective when you compare it to buying your food, not to mention um, what it tastes like, the tastes are amazing. Um, you, it's lower time requirements than an in-ground in garden, and it takes fewer supplies and less space. It takes less room, in fact, than many big countertop appliances. But those first three really can be considerations for urban gardeners. They can be considerations for people um, who have children and who are time crunched, uh, and also for seniors whose um, ability to get out in the garden is limited. Um, and when they go to buy small amounts of um, food, often pay more per gram than um, when large quantities are bought. Uh, for those of us who are gourmands and gourmets, um, they are a very tasty addition to both sweet and savory dishes. And they boost nutritional levels in all raw and cooked vegetables, uh, vegetables and dishes. And we'll go into that a, in a little, a little bit later. They also add variety of texture and flavors. Uh, and um, some of the people that I've spoken to who have kids and who really aren't into salads um, actually get um, quite interested and adventuresome, particularly because um, they've gotten involved in growing food in a very simple, easy way that is easy to supervise from a parental standpoint. And recent studies show that parents and caregivers who encourage their children to help them garden and help them prepare food um, find that their children become more excited about eating a healthy diet. And in the longitudinal studies, um, this learning follows them throughout their life. And I had mentioned about how when um, needs must, uh, when I was younger and lost a job, um, I actually was able to uh, start growing my own uh, greens again. And that made a huge difference. Okay. Um, now, um, this seminar is about two types of indoor greens. So first we're going to compare them and then we'll go uh, in depth into um, the growing, the harvesting, etc. of each type of plant. So come on, you can do it, you can do it, it doesn't want to change. Let's look at the two together. Um, the sprouts are the first stage of a plant once it emerges from the seed. The microgreens are the second stage. So the sprouts, the germinated seed, and you're going to see, and we will look at these in slides for those of you who are not used to uh, being up close and personal uh, with small plants. You'll see the stem, the uh, cotyledon or the seed leaf, we'll talk about that more, and the root. Now the cotyledons are either heart-shaped or oblong and kind of fleshy looking. They're actually part of the seed structure. And as the seed bursts open, you can see they will immediately emerge, but they're not really leaves. 
because they draw out the nutrients that are stored in the seed, which helps the stem and the root to form. Now, the microgreen is the second stage. And this is when you see the first true leaves appearing and showing color. And they indicate that the plant is beginning to draw um, on uh, light for part of its food, beginning to make photosynthesis and feed itself from light. And this will happen anywhere from four to six days. And now you will actually be able to tell what type of plant it is. So sprouts grow with no soil, whereas, whereas microgreens grow um, on a um, hydroponic medium or in so, uh, soil-based growth. Hydroponic means in water, basically. And, and you'll see this as we go through the seminar. Sprouts really need no light. Um, although if you're growing them in a tray and there's a little bit of light in the room, um, that's not a problem. And we'll talk about light needs um, also later on. Whereas microgreens uh, need good light in the optimum spectrum. More on that later. Sprouts are good for an indoor temperature. Um, and uh, microgreens um, need soil at least 55 degrees in order to um, germinate. And they need light for 12 to 14 hours a day. So you are looking at additional light sources here and sometimes additional heat sources if you're growing it in an outdoor greenhouse and you can buy uh, what they call seeding mats and it simply keeps the soil warm enough for the seeds to sprout. Sprouts, um, you're harvesting them. Um, oh, and I made a mistake because you'll harvest them on, um, oh, day three to day seven. Whereas uh, on microgreens, you really won't harvest them before day nine, uh, but then um, you'll, you'll harvest them all the way through day 14. With sprouts, you consume the whole thing and you consume them raw, unless there's things like pea sprouts or bean sprouts that are big healthy fellas and you throw them uh, on top of the vegetable dish at the last minute. Um, with microgreens, you do not consume, consume the roots uh, because they are in the soil or below the screen in the hypro, uh, uh, hydroponic medium. Um, but some species, and I'll show you one, um, the roots are okay if you wash them off. I've just found that they kind of detract from the flavor because they taste woody. However, there you go. And the uses um, for sprouts are those small raw, uh, raw greens for salads or for um, uh, Vietnamese rolls. Uh, you can garnish the dish. You can throw last minute toppings on a soup. Uh, for microgreens, the same thing, but you can also cook the hardio microgreens, steam very lightly, or when you're sauteing a dish, to throw them on top and serve them and they become lightly cooked. So um, how we grow determines how we harvest. And um, this means that we're changing um, flavors because sprouts are very mild tasting. Microgreens have a strong flavor or a stronger flavor and they will always herald the mature plants flavor. In other words, radishes um, are quite peppery. Cabbage and kale have that kind of herby, lovely cabbagey flavor, more nutty than uh, mature cabbage. Peas and beets are sweet. Um, and some herb varieties um, that you might be growing as uh, either micros or sprouts, um, like lemon balm or lemon mint, they have a citrus flavor. So it's quite surprising how you can um, add flavor and texture um, when all you can afford are very simple, the cheapest greens uh, and vegetables that are on sale that week. Now we use approximately 25 varieties of different plants. I've experimented with a few and um, I have half a dozen that are my favorite and 
those are the ones that I use 90% of the time. On your handouts, there's a link to Mom's Sprouting. That web page has probably the most complete product line that I've seen. Uh, their seeds are very high quality, their prices are good, and most important, they list the seeds flavor. They talk about the nutrition levels. Now we're talking nutrition levels that can be very high, up to 25% of the plant per gram. That's higher than beefsteak. Um, and they also give growing directions. I'm not really plugging one company. Um, there is a list of them at the end. I found this one very useful. Now, just a quick note here. Um, the next stage of development um, is what we call baby greens or microgreens. And it's really the completely formed plant. You see on the left, this uh, little uh, broccoli plant here uh, with the cotyledons, the two heart-shaped fleshy leaves and the emerging of um, the true leaves. And this is how um, that plant um, will actually continue to look. If you buy um, baby greens in spinach, you, they have cut those right at the ground level and you'll actually see there's a group of small little oblong leaves and those are actually the cotyledon leaves, they just leave them. Now on the right here um, are sunflower sprouts and uh, they're right at the changeover stage from sprout to microgreen, which is why I pulled them up. You can see the cotyledons, particularly in the bottom middle, um, and you can see right at the nodes at the top of the stem, the fuzzier, flatter um, true leaf emerging. And you'll see um, over on the right uh, towards the lower, that's, that leaf right there is the true leaf. It looks very similar to the cotyledon leaf in sunflowers. Now you can wash, you notice the, the root is very small and very weak and you can wash it off and actually eat that root if you want, but it is, as I say, a little woody. Um, the uh, sunflowers are usually grown as microgreens um, because you have to soak the seed for a long time. They take a long time to sprout and um, uh, they really do better in soil. Uh, so you can cut them off at the base and have a very succulent um, sort of sweet uh, type of uh, plant. Now, here are some more images to illustrate. On the left, we have the mung beans at the sprout stage. And on the left of that picture, you have the little seed casings that have come off. So you can see the um, bean seed and the little yellowish still leaves emerging and the really thick stems. If you grew these same ones very tightly in a jar, you would have the big, long succulent stems um, that you see in the oriental markets. These are grown in just a tray. Uh, in the middle, you have radish seeds and you can see the um, seed, which is dark and the cotyledons emerging, which are very, very pale yellow. And you can see all this fuzzy stuff. Now, you might think that that's mold, but I'm gonna show you pictures of mold later. And if you take a magnifying glass, you'll see that they are very, very tiny, fine roots. And many of your seeds will have the, the furry stuff, um, but you can also see the rest of the plant is healthy. And if you're not sure, a magnifying glass will tell you immediately. Now on the, on the right, um, we have two um, trays of pea sprouts. On the left, this is what the pea sprouts look like. And you'll see how many is in that tray. That tray is about eight inches across and about two, two and a half inches high. And I've thrown those in. They will plump up 
um, after soaking for a couple of hours in just room temperature water. And they become what you see on the right. You can see the green beginning to show on the leaves. You can see the green um, seed and you can see the white stem. And if you looked very closely, um, the pea looks like a head with two horns. On the one side is the white stem, on the other side is the uh, monocot, the single root that a pea has. And these seeds, um, the pea seeds, end up remaining very, very sweet. So when you eat the pea sprout, it tastes like fresh peas. It's quite wonderful and it's crunchy. Um, now, microgreens are quite another group. Um, on the left, in the upper top, um, we have a commercial display. And notice that they're all very tightly uh, grown in very little medium in the bottom. And the uh, stems are held in place by the clear plastic dishes they're in. Those dishes were dropped into the hy uh, hydroponic medium uh, so they can be lifted up. And this allows um, the farmer to market and sell them in the original containers. It saves a lot of labor. Um, the containers are cheaper than taking them out and repackaging them. And they're fairly delicate uh, microgreens. And this way they can be kept at the peak quality without touching them. Now at the bottom left, we've got a close-up of red cabbage. And um, there's technically still at the sprout stage, but um, cabbage has big, strong stems. And so planted to closely together on a grow mat, um, they remain upright and succulent and can be eaten at this stage, or they can be eaten at um, the microgreen stage. And the tastiest part of their spicy flavor is in that thick stem. Now, a similar image on the bottom from the True Leaf Market, you'll see how they were grown in uh, soil. And this is a Tatsui, which is an Asian green of the Brassica family. So it's uh, of the cabbage family. And it has the similar growth um, to the purple cabbage and succulent stems, but it's much milder. Now, finally on the right, you'll see um, wheatgrass. And look at the huge mat of roots there. This is actually grown quite a bit larger than most microgreens. Um, easy to do because it's a grass. And um, this particular um, image um, shows wheatgrass being grown um, that will later be cut off, the roots composted, and those tops will be juiced. So you can see the great variety and, um, and how we um, harvest is how we go about growing and what kind of food you want. So how do we do that? What every plant needs, this may seem ridiculously simple. When you're growing sprouts and microgreens, the rules don't change, but because you're dealing with a compressed time frame, not two months, three months, the whole season, not 50 days, 60 days, but a matter of between three to five days or 10 days to two weeks at the very maximum. So understanding these needs and how they apply to this very fast growing mini food is important. So we're talking about the critical first two stages of growth. The directions are simple. As I say, they're more critical. So following them closely and understanding how fast they will change is very important. Let's look at, come on, you can do it, you can change. There we go. Basic growing directions. Now, whether they're sprouts or microgreens, everything starts as a sprout. But if you're only gonna grow sprouts, 
um, here's your basics and we will look at the additional things needed for microgreens. Most important, store your seed correctly. A cool, dry, dark place. Use a breathable container. And if you have any of those desiccating uh, package, uh, packaging that they use in vitamins and I get mine when I buy my nori, um, they'll have a, a desiccator pack. Throw that in if you can. Uh, it keeps everything very dry. Um, first of all, uh, you have to have a sterile grow container. That means soap and hot water. I always rinse with, with a vinegar after because it rinses the water away. And then I rinse the vinegar off. Um, very important. Um, sprinkle your seed evenly. And then you spritz your seed to moisten it. And then you put your lid on. And then you rinse it gently twice a day. We'll talk about rinsing techniques later. Very important. Let the water drain out completely each time. If you see things that don't look quite good, pick them out and clean them off. And then harvest, da 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 da. Next, these are the additional things that you might need um, or that you will need uh, for growing microgreens. When you set up your tray, you prepare it with your growing medium. Then you wet down that growing medium and let it drain completely. We'll talk about different types of growing mediums, whether it's pure hydroponic on a screen or whether it's um, matting or various things. We'll look at those. Then you sprinkle your seeds again. Then you spritz your seeds to moisten it. And then you cover your medium and the seeds to remove the light. A very easy way to do it, if you grow, if you grow them in um, those long um, sprouting trays, is you simply put another tray on top, um, or you can you can just have um, a plastic dome that you've made dark by putting paper over it or something. Um, that encourages the seeds to sprout faster. Um, then you remove it and you add your lights. And, we're, and you're going to have to have special lights for that. Then uh, you add um, your organic liquid nutrients, which you can buy, uh, or you're going to rely on the high quality of your soil. Uh, if you're finding your soil is lean, you can add liquid fertilizer um, to the soil um, just by watering. Then you harvest. And then you have to know how to either reuse your growing mediums or the soil, how to make sure that that remains healthy and doesn't make your seeds rot. Uh, and of course, you, you have harvested it. Um, now, there are, there are always a few exceptions. And here are some of the most common when you're choosing what seeds to use. Sunflowers, as I mentioned, are really best only for microgreens, but as microgreens, they're some of the most successful. If you're using large beans, um, uh, well, even the small adzuki bean, but your large bean, like your Romano bean or your Pinto bean um, and peas, you want to soak them for a few hours until they get plump. As the as the seed breaks open, you'll find that some of them are non-starters and they will begin to go mushy. You wanna just pick out those because um, you're not gonna have a healthy environment. They're actually very obvious and easy to pick out. Um, and there's a group that we call mucilaginous, arugula, basil, chia, and cress. Um, um, they produce um, a mucus around the seed itself and that protects the seed so you um it's because their native area is a bit dry they're used to getting one rain and then it gets dry so the easiest way to grow these is whether you're going to grow them in a, a sprout tray um, or as a microgreen you put unbleached paper on the bottom and that paper's wet and then it dries out. 
and you can control your moisture because you can see how wet that paper is. So you can spritz lighter and lower the moisture area. And then once they sprout, they're fine. They act like other seeds. But if you particularly like those flavors, then um, that additional technique is very good. I found with arugula that I often didn't need to do that. I just needed to keep them spread thinly and um, not let them um, uh, get too moist just by the lightest, tiniest spritzing. Now, what else have we got here? Our next slide is this. And I'm going to go back for a minute. Well, actually, I'll let you look at this while I explain what's going on. There are two needs that um, there are two needs that affect our plants in an indoor environment that are a greater concern than the other things that plants need, um, because moisture and heat can be easily and quickly changed and we will immediately see a change in our seeds. But light is a very special consideration. How you start is how you grow and food is the other consideration. So let's deal with light. If you wanna grow microgreens, you need an additional light source. Indoor lighting is the wrong color, the long, wrong spectrum. Uh, anyone who's a photographer um, will really see that where they shoot something indoors with natural light and with incandescent light. And um, indoor lighting is not intense enough. It's, it just doesn't give the plant lumens, what, which is what it needs. Now with proper lighting, you grow bigger greens close together, use less money and less growth medium. So if you want to be growing microgreens, that's an important consideration. Now there are four types of lights. They're incandescent, which is the old round bulb. They're fluorescent, they're halogen, and there is the LED. So here we're back up. You'll see on the left of this slide, at the very top, our blue light. Red and blue are the most critical to plants. The red light stimulates the vegetative growth um, and um, the blue light regulates its growth. So that's very good for growing uh, short, stocky, strong um, seedlings. And you can see at the top, clear blue daylight. Down in the, in the middle on the left, a cloudy day. And right smack dab in the middle, noon daylight. And now you see our bulbs coming into play and the evening sun. And look at that down at the bottom, candle flame and sunset or very early sunrise. So the, um, uh, the plants will use the full spectrum as you see the whole thing for photosynthesis. And that is using sunlight and the water they contain to create glucose, which is some of their food. Now, lumens are the actual amount of light, the intensity of the light. For an example, um, some of my family um, in Colorado, they live at 5,280 feet, the Mile High City. I start my tomatoes late January, early February. Their ground doesn't even thaw out till late April. And my sister throws her stuff into the ground about May and she is harvesting tomatoes before I am because of the quality of the sunlight, because of the intensity, the lumens of the sun. So very important. Now um, you can see uh, watts are the measure of energy consumption. So you can see um, the cost. And um, uh, it shows the effectiveness. Now, the fluorescent type of bulb is two or three, gives you two or three times more light than an incandescent bulb for the same cost. 
They're the most inexpensive lights and so readily available, very good for indoor gardening. I've been using them for years, but I use the full spectrum fluorescent light because it produces a balance that replicates the natural uh, spectrum. And although they're not quite as efficient as other ones, um, they, um, and they, pr they produce a wee bit more heat, which is a good thing in a cool room if you're growing it inside um, or in your outdoor small greenhouse. But given the wider range of light frequencies emitted, they really are a, a great choice. Now, the T5 bulbs are um, a small round bulb, about five inches in diameter. So they're less bulky than the long tubular fluorescent bulbs. Um, and I'll show you a, um, an image of these in the do-it-yourself section. Um, but because they don't distribute the light, there are some problems and we can look at those. Now, then you've got your compact fluorescent and they fit in an incandescent bulb, but they're not as energy efficient and they create a beam that can be have hot spots in it. Now, the high uh, energy bulb, yes, they emit twice the lumens as a fluorescent, but they need special fixtures. They're very expensive and they can also blow out your electrical panel. Um, in addition, they're so bright, you have to wear shade glasses um, while you're working. They are mainly for some commercial ventures. Um, the basics in using your light is that they need to be two or three inches above the seed. Um, and that's why um, it's, it's a good thing to hang your fluorescent um, uh, on a chain because then you can uh, move it up and down. So once past the sprout stage, um, as we've already said, your plants need about 12 to 14 hours a day of light. I, I, put, I put mine on um, a timer and uh, turn the room lights off, uh, close the door because the cats love those trays and I'll leave the timer to do its work. Um, now let's look, last on our list um, is food. Sprouts feed themselves. They need minimal light and they need moisture. So a fresh water spritz and a rinse and the normal light in the room is all they need. As the switchover occurs to microgreens, the greening of the leaves provide photosynthesis. And so now the plant is able to make its own food. And now you see why the light is so important because without the correct light spectrum, it won't make good food and you'll have spindly plants, you'll have disease, all sorts of things. Um, now the rest of the food that the microgreen uses is taken up through the soil or through the fertilized water in uh, the hydroponic growth system. So here are, the, here are the, the growing mediums that are used. You can have a potting soil mix that you buy. Um, some people use peat moss and you can see I am not at all pleased with that idea. It is not eco-friendly. Um, peat bogs um, uh, take hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years to regenerate. Um, we have trees in the... Um, um, oh goodness, and the name of the bog um, in the lower mainland eludes me. Uh, Burns bog. There are spruce trees in Burns bog that are 800 years old and are two and a half feet tall. And that's how long that peat takes to generate plants. And everything that peat, peat moss does can be done with other types of products, core fiber, um, perlite, uh, potting mix, so a uh, potting soil mix. Um, so please don't use peat moss, but I'm listing it so you know. You can also use sterilized soil 
um, if you want to take the time to sterilize it yourself and add commercial worm castings. Um, they contain um, many um, important um, products um, that enhance the soil, particularly humeric acid. I won't go into that. Just believe me, worm castings are gold. If you're doing it hydroponically, again, you can have a core fiber mat or a hemp mat. Uh, these are available commercially. You can also use unbleached paper, uh, it, it, one or several layers um, over your um, screen tray above your water source. Um, and uh, if you're doing it in a jar, I've, I've seen them grown in an old colander um, sitting in a giant mug and the unbleached paper was a coffee filter. So you can do it big, you can do it small. Um, you'll need those screens for them to sit on um, so the plant doesn't drown, but the roots get water and you need a special liquid fertilizer and you can get organic eco-friendly fertilizers for hydroponic systems. Now, um, we're going to talk a bit about that soil and whatnot. You see this picture. Um, this is what the what the mat looks like um, after harvest. You can see the plants were cut off, and all the roots and whatnot are sitting on top of the grow tray, and the water was put up to the top of the um, mat and you've got a good healthy root system, but now you've got to do something with it. You can compost it if you have an in-ground garden um, by shredding it and um, putting it at two weeks of very high temperatures and then um, reforming it and using it. Um, you can use it a gar uh, as garden mulch, just shred it and spread it over top of your shrubs. It's like good like leaf mold. You can sterilize it in the oven, but it's difficult because now you have to pull out all those roots and it's very time consuming. It can be done. Um, I have yet to seen it um, really recommended. If you're looking at the amount of time and labor, as long as you can buy fresh and dispose of it correctly, you're probably better off, but far be it from me to tell you what to do. The last thing you can do is you can break it up. You can shred it. You can just put it in small enough pieces, put it in your green bin. It is uh, a garden waste, very collectible, very recyclable. As you see, it can be composted. Now, what else? There? That probably that probably does it. Now, um, we're going to look at some of the basic equipment that you need. And there will be some um, do-it-yourself, some DIY, uh, just to give you a sense of what you're going to need to invest. So you're going to need grow trays or some type of sprouter system. You're going to need a cover, domes, uh, sometimes screens. You're going to need lighting, light stands, lamps, if you're going to do microgreens. Um, you're going to need racks. You can even have a small greenhouse and both um, larger scale sprouting systems and microgreen systems might use those. You're going to need a water delivery system. Now this may sound odd, but if you're saving space and you have it in a closet where children and pets can't get at it, and uh, you just have the overhead light uh, in the closet, how are you going to get water to it? So you need to think about that. I mean, simple, right? just watering can, but you have to think about that. You're gonna to have to think about drainage and um, what grow mediums, which we've talked about, cleaning supplies, um, which are pretty basic because you got them in your kitchen, timers. Um, I use the timers for um, my Christmas lights and my grow, uh, my seeding mats and my microgreens. So, I have three timers and they've more than paid for themselves and possibly your heat mats 
if you're going to be using a greenhouse. I did find my heat mats were very helpful because um, I grew lettuce greens on my in my patio greenhouse all year. And those heat mats just ensured that the soil stayed warm. Now, here are some commercial systems. On the left, um, bean screens. So you can just see a regular jar and um, you fill it up with water, you tip it out and there you go. Uh, in the middle are actually the trays that I use, which are the bio snacky, and they've gotten more expensive, but they're actually not that expensive. And I have used these trays for close to 20 years. So pretty good, no, actually only 15 years. So um, they're, uh, they were a very good investment. I got the one, realized that three wasn't enough. Um, but now with the six, I have four different types of seeds and I rotate them. So I have lots of flavors. In the left, on the left um, are two stacks of peas. In the bottom are beans. On the right, um, the colorful ones, those are radish seeds, beautifully peppery. Um, and the bottom two um, are red clover and the bottom is alfalfa. On the right, you can see the seed sprouter. You can buy these at Walmart. So just a different system. You'll notice that they have um, trays in the bottom to catch water. So you put the water in the top and you just let it percolate down all the way through the bottom. And it's very efficient, very simple. Here are some stands and trays. Uh, the upper left, uh, there's a self-contained system. That same black tray you'll see in the middle with a low dome and you can kind of see the green seeds started. Um, and that is actually a regular seed sprouting tray. So you could use it as um, sprouts uh, or microgreens in soil um, or for your later garden, including flowers. Um, here's a handy dandy stand where you can slide um, the light up and down and uh, put a tray underneath. The far right, here's a demonstration of a DIY system. These are old uh, desk lamps that I've put the little fluorescent bulbs in. And there, I pulled them up a little higher than what I would usually have. But you can see that they create that beam uh, and uh, they, the stuff in the middle is, doesn't have quite enough light. <coughs> I also pulled them up high on the right so you can see how the plants become spindly when they don't get that light close enough to them. But spindly plants that you can eat are better than no plants. But I wanted to show you that range. Now here's some more do-it-yourself equipment that I have used. Um, you can see the deli uh, containers and very easy to take your ice pick and poke holes in the bottom. Um, in the bottom left, uh, I've taken that top off the organic spinach uh, clamshell and I've used it as a tray on the bottom. So that can protect the uh, table. So I take that container, I put it in the sink, I let the water throw, flow through, I wipe off the bottom, I put it back on the container. In the middle, um, that's my equipment. I got a, a spritzer, I've got an old um, herb um, glass jar uh, with the um, holes in the lid so I can just sprinkle my seed out and I've got an old toothbrush. And here um, I've grown mung beans in one of my old preserving jars. I've cut a round of um, a bag that I bought something like carrots or something in that does got holes in it. And then just an elastic band to keep on the top. Now, what have I got next here? Let's take a look.
we need to talk about food safe because we're dealing with food. We're dealing with food in an artificial environment. Um, now, there are four primary sources of contamination, your water, your equipment, the seeds themselves, or the person handling the product. But just so you don't feel bad, I'm going to read this article, Safety Tips, and this is from the MUMS website. Quote, in a given year, getting hit by lightning, which is 1.29 people per million, is more likely than contacting E. coli, uh, which is 1.1 million per people, uh, from meat, poultry, shellfish, mil uh, milk, eggs, and produce combined. Since produce represents the smallest risk of all these foods, uh, in other words, 41 outbreaks in five years, and since sprouts represent an even smaller risk, 12 in 40 years, the benefits of eating sprouts dramatically, statistically and historically outweigh their contamination risks. The other thing is that if you don't take care of sprouts and microgreens, 24 hours, they simply rot. Um, they, they, do, they, they have no patience. They're busy getting on with it. And we are taking advantage of this very rapid growth stage to make food. Now, uh, before you handle the product, wash your hands. Uh, use clean jars. I explained about washing the jar with hot soapy water or your trays and then spraying with vinegar and rinsing. Um, rinse your sprouts well at least twice a day. You can either tip the jar for the excess water to come out, or you have a flow through system. You can use tap water um, or um, the uh, misting um, nozzle on your, your tap. Um, the main thing is avoid puddles. Let everything be evenly done and evenly rinsed. And, um, it doesn't hurt to rinse the seeds, the larger seeds, um, before starting your initial soaking uh, period for, for the seeds. Um, that is um, just an extra caution to make sure they're clean. But of course, life isn't um, perfect and we have trouble. And um, several of these slides you have on your handouts because they are the things you're going to use more often. So I'm just going to quickly read through them. Um, the uh, poor germination. Um, so we talked about proper storage. We talked about air drying the seed. Uh, um, oh, we didn't talk about that. But um, if the seed looks a little moist or the container shows humidity, air dry them. And, um, and then put a desiccator pack in the container. Um, if the seed doesn't want to grow, you'll know immediately. Sprinkle your seeds less densely. The tendency is, is to pile the seed up too much. That doesn't give them the optimum amount of air circulation. Um, also, buy seed with less than a year best before date. Seed is always good for at least one year. Uh, most are good for two years. Um, beyond that, you'll find that your germination rate drops down. If that doesn't bother you, just use them. But understand, you'll get a lower germination rate. Be wary of seeds that are on sale because they're usually past their fresh date. Um, and if your area has very high chlorine in the water, all you have to do is pour it in a bowl, let it sit for 12 or 24 hours. Chlorine is very volatile and will bleed off. Um, or you can use filtered water. Um, I've done both. I've also used uh, just uh, regular tap water um, and um, it's all fine. Other areas, this might not be the case. If you have mold, it means your, your equipment isn't properly sterilized. Drain your water from your, from your sprouting container. Make sure it's drained before you put your lid back on and go on and go about your business. Sprinkle your seeds less densely, particularly your small grass seeds like alfalfa or clover. If you have weak spindly plants, your light's not strong enough. Um, you also need to increase the humidity, which just means less, um, uh, uh, fewer spritzing 
and lighter. Now, if you're getting digestive problems, take a look across about the chlorine um, and uh, rinse your sprouts more. Your nose will actually always tell you, smell your sprouts. If it smells earthy and fresh or nutty or kind of like what you think the plant might taste like, you're fine. If it smells sour um, or sickly sweet, um, it's not healthy. Uh, you can always throw it out and start again. It's only two or three days till the next group come up. Um, for microgreens, now this is both with soil or hydroponic mats. Um, you're looking at the sprout concerns, but there are a couple of things to add. Used your bagged proper soil or fresh hydroponic mats and always use commercial organic liquid fertilizer. Um, don't make your own. You don't know what nutrients are in it. Really, you don't. And if you make a tea, um, all your, it's not that it doesn't have nutrients, but it only has water soluble nutrients. So um, for the small cost, if you're gonna use liquid fertilizers, um, you can buy organic, um, but if you find you're getting mold, you're feeding your plant to death because liquid fertilizers um, are living things. So you're getting mold from them. Lower your concentration levels. If you're poor germination, same thing as with sprouts. Make sure your light level is high enough and make sure your soil temperature is above 60 degrees or your water temperature is above 60 degrees. If your plants are tall, spindly, lower your fertilizer strength. If you have digestive concerns, we've already talked about that. And one thing with microgreens, it's rare, but it is possible to have a few pests, mainly um, little flies uh, like fruit flies, um, drosophilus um, or aphid. So you need to re-sterilize your trays. You need to throw out your soil and buy proper sterilized potting soil or grow medium, and then throw out your homemade fertilizers. Now, uh, here's some pictures. You notice on the left, uh, if you hearken back to our radish seeds, they had that lovely um, furry stuff. Look at here, these are um, clover seeds. And look, they're spindly and they've got these white blobs. I, I let them get in a bad condition so I could show this to you. That's mold. And you'll find the clover seeds don't smell fresh. Throw it out. On the left um, are sunflower seeds uh, grown in a medium, but not enough light. They should be thick, strong seeds. In the middle is arugula with the same difficulty. And on the right is broccoli. And here we have not enough light and what happens with them. Now, I ate all these plants, um, but they weren't as tasty. Um, I couldn't grow them out to their full height um, to maximize the food value of my harvest. Now, finally, uh, what do we have here? I'll give you some uh, tips and tricks. The larger the, the seed, the stronger the flow of water, water they will tolerate. And you want a good flow of water that matches the type of seed you're using. So, Seeds like peas and beans um, or grains or radish, um, you can just rinse with a faucet spray, uh, sprayer. What I do with my peas and beans um, when I go to soak them and plump them up is that I, I rub my hand lightly over them and it, it takes off all the coating uh, from the seeds. They sprout better and they don't grow mold. Um, you can also flip your seeds into a colander and rinse them back and forth and then turn them into your um, 
trays and lightly spread them with your hand. Um, seeds swell when they uh, germinate. So don't be afraid to sprinkle them lightly. They should only fill the tray for sprouts. And you remember the peas that I showed you when they're really growing. When you're growing microgreens, you sow them closer because you want them to crowd, reach for the light and get plump stems with the greenery on top. And what other things can I suggest? Um, having a dedicated place to grow things really does minimize many problems. Um, a window ledge is great if it's wide enough, but there's usually not enough light from daylight. So have a place you can hang a light. Um, if you're using a small upright greenhouse, um, you can always uh, take that in from the patio into the garage for the winter. You don't have to leave it outside. Uh, again, you're going to need lights. Um, you can have a multi-rack stand. Actually, I just bought one of those storage racks uh, from one of the big box stores um, and hung my fluorescent lights on top. And there was airflow because the uh, racks um, had had holes in them. Uh, I also had an upright uh, greenhouse um, with wire racks and that sat inside uh, for my sprouts and greens during winter. Um, always make sure you've got electricity plugs nearby for lights. And if they're outdoor, make sure they're covered. Uh, you wouldn't think that that would be important, but if you've got an older house with only one light plug or one uh, a wall plug in the room, you need to think about that. Um, by, keeping, by keeping your um, growing garden in a separate place, you're really able to keep it away from kids um, and from pets. And with kids, it's often, oh boy, it's time to go to the indoor garden and everybody troops in and takes care and then everybody troops out. And, the last thing is that one kid gets to set the timer. Um, and so it can be an event. Um, what else? I think that kind of gives you a sense of all the basics on what to do and how to grow. Uh, I will say this for anyone who is a new gardener, is that if you take the time and you watch your plants sprout and grow, experiment a little, realize that you have an opportunity to learn and experiment in a very, very short time frame. You're not growing five big pumpkin plants and then by the time in two months, well, it's 120 days to harvest, um, you messed up and you have no harvest. You're learning um, everything that you need to know how to grow, either a food crop or an ornamental crop. When you take the time to grow a sprout, a microgreen, and then take a group of your microgreens, um, plant them in soil, but instead of two inches, plant them in four to six inches or as tall as that, tray will allow and grow them out to baby greens. You can harvest the leaves off the baby greens, see how the plant responds to partial harvest, see if it's a type of lettuce that likes cut and come again, for instance, and you will actually have learned everything you need to know about a full season of any kind of growth compressed into a very short time. So here we have all the Canadian sources and I kept it to Canadian sources because shipping is not a supply, it is not a concern. Um, these are all, they all feature organic, non-GMO, high quality seeds and uh, eco-sensitive supplies. Uh, and you can shop online for all of these things, except of course your local food store. 
which carries a lot of these products, but um, you could buy them direct and on my research, it's often cheaper. And finally, um, this is your book list. When April sent you the handouts, you'll notice that it had live links to um, their catalog. So most of these books are actually in the library and you can check them out. I don't know which are eBooks and or audiobooks. Uh, however, uh, there is one at the bottom that I know is an eBook, so I put that down. Um, and that's, uh, that's about it uh, for it. Um, and I know I didn't stop. Um, I had more material than I thought. Let's take a look at the chats. Um, someone is asking about where I can get unbleached paper aside from um, coffee filters. Uh, you can buy paper towels that's unbleached. Um, you can buy a newsprint by the roll, although I find that's not as good at it. Uh, disintegrates. Um, storage life of a pack of seeds. We did, uh, um, we did talk about that. I have had seeds that are four and five years old and I get a very low germination rate, but I still get germination. Um, Ah, now this is a very good question here. Some seed packs are mixed types of seed. Do they grow as, a, as well as a single type of speed, a seed? I have found in most cases, they do not for the simple reason that they are different sizes and different size seeds and different varieties of seeds grow at different rates. And so I've taken to getting all my seeds in separate packages, only one type in a package and growing them in uh, separate trays and combining them as I want. What uh, promotions of NPK should we be using for organic fertilizer? Good question. Uh, a COF, uh, which is a complete organic fertilizer, uh, works just fine, 444. Um, fish fertilizer is a, is a wonderful, wonderful uh, fertilizer um, uh, as a liquid fertilizer. I use it and have done for years. It is a byproduct of the fish industry. So you're reusing a product. And that's always good. Um, Alaska, um, there's several. Um, I find uh, I've gotten used to the Alaska fertilizer. Um, it comes in um, 01010, which is your blooming fertilizer. And it comes in uh, 511, so high in nitrogen. So what I do is that I combine these in different combinations uh, to get a general fertilizer. For, for microgreens, you're really promoting green growth. So something that's higher in N, in nitrogen, um, is more what you want. In terms of kelp um, fertilizers and whatnot, um, they are also very good because they have a lot of soluble minerals. This is a very difficult thing to achieve in growing food crops are soluble minerals because it depends so much on soil temperature and all sorts of things. But seaweed is a unique type of plant and um, it's known for being high in minerals. Why would I use um, a liquid kelp? Because Many of the microgreens we grow are brassicas of the cabbage family. Plants never forget where they came from. Cabbages, wild cabbages still grow, I'm told. One day I will go there 
on the mountainsides of Mount Olympus. Is that cool? And we're first domesticated like, oh, 5,000 years ago. So they still say, um, I don't care how long I've been domesticated. I still need a lot of minerals in the soil. And what does kelp give us? Minerals. So it is a good product. Test them. Take two trays, put one type of fertilizer in one, one in the other. Remember, you're going to see it in a matter of days and it will tell you what will work best for you. Uh, and what else have we got here? What are my favorite seeds? <laughs> I've come down to, I love peas and I love mung beans. I, uh, um, I grow radishes, but not all the time because I don't always want peppery uh, microgreens. Um, I really fall back onto alfalfa a lot. Um, it is probably the least troublesome of all the tiny seeds um, and is very fast sprouting. Uh, I will grow kale. Um, although kale seeds to buy, com buy commercially can be a little expensive. I used to grow my own kale out um, and collect the seed because they produce a lot of seed. Um, so I, I really default to about four or five kinds because they're the ones I like. Occasionally I'll experiment with a few of them and I've experimented with probably at least a dozen, dozen different types. Um, and occasionally, as a matter of fact, I've got some growing right now, um, is some wheatgrass. Um, and, um, and the wheat uh, is, is very sweet and it's nice. Um, and I like it from time to time, but I don't find the grain seeds really to my palate. I'd much rather have the grass seeds or uh, the cabbage seeds and stuff like that. Um, is it bad for sprouting jars to be exposed to light? Um, yes and no. Put them on the back of your counter where they are kind of in the shade. If you put them near a bright light, um, particularly a window, they're liable to get scalded because they're in a high moisture environment. And seeds don't need, a, uh, sprouts don't need a lot of light. Microgreens do need light. Um, I think that's the end of our questions. Um, I'll leave the chat up. Are there any other questions? It will come out. Um, I saw a couple that you might have missed. Um, are there? Um, someone says, I love using my bio snacky book. Oh, Did yes. That, one? Yeah. that it's not using the sprouts quickly enough. Can I take them out of the tray and store them in the fridge to slow down deterioration? Very good question. I use the bio snacky and, uh, and I use jars. What I will do is that I'll take, if I want to, uh, if I've got more seeds, I simply, uh, or they're only partially grown and I want to start some more, I'll put them in a jar and grow them out. I'll also do the opposite. Uh, particularly with my mung beans because they grow in jars so well. And I'll grow a bunch and then spread them in the bio snackies. Um, can you take them out in the fridge to slow down deterioration? Yes. At that point though, consider them harvested. They will store in the fridge for about five days if you put them in a veggie bag. That's with the holes. But they're really not going to grow. It's too cold. So uh, grow them as long as you want to grow them harvest them, grow some more. Um, any thoughts on non-plastic containers for microgreens in soil? Non-plastic containers. Yes, um, they're growing in the soil. The container simply holds them. And you can get recyclable plastics, but if you want to use other types of containers, no reason why not. Um, they're growing in the soil. As long as the container is non-toxic, um, you're laughing. Um, is there anything else? Do you see anything, April? Uh, no, I think that covered all. That's about it. Well, um, thank you very much for attending the session.
it will be available, won't it, April? Uh, uh, not too long. Um, on uh, yeah, we don't have an exact timeline, but we hope to get that posted uh, onto our YouTube channel, and um, I'll be sending out a link for those who are interested. Yeah. To... So isn't that isn't that good? Um, and again, thank you. It has been a um, pleasure and an honor to spend this time with you. Yes. Thank you, Joe. And thanks everyone for attending. And you're welcome, you're welcome, you're welcome to all the thanks I'm getting. <laughs>